The second lesson this morning comes also from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. I will read chapter 29, verses 1 through 7, which you can find on page 731 in the Hebrew Bible section of your Pew Bibles. Listen now for the word of the Lord. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconia and the Queen Mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, son of Shephon, and Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom King Zedekiah of Judah sent to Babylon to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? God, we look and listen for a word from you to give us a point of view that is more than our own. Help us to chew on it and savor it and be made well by it. Amen. The young Arab man approached a mirror in the washroom of Israel's West Jerusalem bus station. Bashir Kerry stood alone before a row of porcelain basins and leaned forward regarding himself. He turned his head slightly left to right and then back again. He smoothed his hair, nudged his tie, pinched his clean-shaven face. He was making certain all of this was real. For nearly two decades, since he was six years old, Bashir had been preparing for this journey. It was the breath, the currency, the bread of his family, of nearly every family he knew. It was what everyone talked about all the time. Return. In exile, there was little else worth dreaming of. With his two cousins, Bashir Kerry got on a bus to take them from Ramallah, where they had lived as refugees, to Israel. Due to recent changes in the territory that Israel occupied and to the deployment of Israeli forces to defend new borders, all of which were results of the Six-Day War of 1967 that had just ended a few weeks earlier, Bashir and his cousins were seizing upon the long-awaited and dreamed-of opportunity to return to al Ramla, their hometown. Finally stepping foot into their hometown, they made their way to Bashir's childhood home, the home that Bashir's father had built for his family 30 years earlier, and that Bashir had lived in until Israel conquered al Ramla and all the Muslim Arabs living there were removed. Ringing the bell at the front gate, Bashir wondered who would now be on the other side of the door. That is when Bashir met Dahlia. Dahlia was a young Jewish woman whose family in 1948 had emigrated from Europe to Israel to find security in a Jewish state. Upon arriving to Israel, they were transported to the town of Ramla and a 
along with busloads of other Jewish immigrants. They were told by a Jewish agency simply to pick one of the empty Arab homes, enter it, inspect it, and claim it. Dahlia's parents picked Bashir's family home, and from that point on, they owned it and lived in it. Until then, it was the only home Dahlia had known. <coughs> Upon opening the gate and seeing the three Arab men standing there, Dahlia knew in her gut why they had come. She invited them inside, and when they crossed the threshold, Bashir remembers feeling as if he were in a mosque, as if he, Bashir, were a holy man. According to Dahlia, Bashir looked like a man in a trance, he floated down hallways and in and out of doorways, touching the glass, wood, painted plaster wall, absorbing the tactile feel of every surface. Recalling how she felt as she watched them, Dahlia says, and I had a sense that they were walking in a temple in silence. This true story of Bashir and Dahlia is beautifully narrated by Sandy Tolan in the book, The Lemon Tree. Imagine how many other such stories there are today in our world. There are today over 70 million forcibly displaced persons worldwide, and over 25 million of them are considered refugees. For every person who has been displaced from a home and from a land, there must be a story like this. The story of Bashir and Dahlia raises to emotional consciousness the depth of longing that people have to be home. We all yearn to belong somewhere, to be in a safe place, to have a home. It is a universal pursuit. As such, this yearning to be rooted in a place is not a new struggle. We find this theme all over the Bible, so much so that biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann thinks that land is a central, if not the central theme of biblical faith. For certain, it is the major theme that the prophet Jeremiah addresses. In the two scripture lessons we read from the book of Jeremiah, we see that the prophet knows very well the depth of attachment to the land felt by the Jewish people. Attached to the land are the important words that were spoken there, the promises made, the vows exchanged, and the vocations and identities formed. In fact, the land was integral to the collective identity of Israel. For the land came to be understood as the place where they were with Yahweh. Interestingly, most often in the Bible, we find Israel to be a landless people. Early on, from the time of Abraham, the Hebrew people were sojourners, leaving a familiar place and accepting landlessness as a posture of faith. During the time of Isaac and Jacob, Israel learns what it means to be resident aliens over an extended period of time. As slaves in Egypt, then as wanderers in the wilderness, and then as people forced into exile once in the 8th century by the Babylon Assyrians, and then in the 6th century by the Babylonians. Without land or even the prospect of it, Israel was at its lowest point when exiled by the Babylonians. So it is significant when in chapter 32, Jeremiah is told by God to bail his relative out of financial difficulty by purchasing land that has come from his kinsmen. You can see from the detail given in the story that it is important for the transaction to be properly and meticulously carried out. Cash is to be transferred, Titles and deeds are to be signed. Witnesses are to verify the signing. And copies of the, of the transaction are to be publicly filed and securely stored. 
One wonders if it might be foolish for Jer Jeremiah to purchase land at a time when the land is under military occupation and at a time when the communi community is facing deportation. Jeremiah's actions show to the public, however, that there will be life after the exile. Yes, yes, yes. So sure of this is Jeremiah that he puts his money where his mouth is. The transaction, sealed and deposited in a jar, represents a firm hope in Israel's long-term future as a people who can return home to their land. That this future is a long way off is indicated in the letter Jeremiah writes to those who are in exile. Through the word of the prophet, God encourages them to build houses, plant gardens, marry and bear children. God encourages them to work for and even pray for the well-being, peace, and wholeness of the city into which they have been exiled. Such counsel requires the Israelites to completely reorient themselves in relation to the land. Not only must they adjust to the reality that they will be in exile for generations, and understand that any hope for return will be a very long-term hope, they must also stop resenting their imperial masters and instead invest themselves in the welfare, the shalom, of their present new home. This message, as pastoral as it sounds, is where we find Jeremiah at his most prophetic. Here he imagines something that the Jewish kings with their land-oriented kingdoms could never have considered. Here Jeremiah proclaims that the exiled are the bearers of Judah's hope for the future and that the exile is the place where God's faithful promises will be worked out. Jeremiah's prophetic message was not merely that the loss of land was inevitable and moreover intended by God, but also that the people in exile were to seek the shalom of the city. No king with a kingdom, with land, could have ever conceived of such a notion. In this way, Jeremiah, in true prophetic fashion, imagines a possibility that the nation's rulers cannot see. In a book entitled At Home in Exile, Alan Wolf, professor of political science and director of the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life at Boston College, makes the case that contrary to centuries of Jewish thought, being in exile can be good. It can be good for the Jews who are living outside of Israel, as well as the Jews who are living inside Israel. And it can be good for the non-Jews with whom they live in society, both outside and inside Israel. Ever since the beginning of Zionism in the late 19th century, many Jews have considered it close to heresy to condone life in the diaspora. They've looked down with disdain upon Jews living outside Israel. And this disdain has been tied up with the fear that only statehood offers a safe home in a world that has tried to exterminate them. In the midst of this politics of place and homeland, Alan Wolf asks, what if the diaspora is a blessing in disguise? To be able to ask this question takes, I think, prophetic imagination. <clears throat> it takes prophetic imagination to wonder if exile might be the place where shalom can be brought about. As luring as the promises of safety and security may be, in the end, Alan Wolf worries that Zionism will only alienate Israel from a universalism concern for all people. It is important to remember, he thinks, that it was in exile that the Jewish people learned what it felt like to be a minority, to be less powerful, 
to be at the mercy of others' hospitality. As hard as these lessons may be, they are, he thinks, blessings, because they are what is required to develop care for all people and sympathy for the underdog. Such universalism of care is what people in exile, wherever they are, can contribute to the world. It is what people in the diaspora could prophetically contribute to the people who are in Israel. Making this case, he reminds his fellow Jews that much longer than the Zionist movement has been around, their history has been one in which they have been a people in exile and that blessings of exile are older and more enduring than the evils of statelessness. What if the world, not just Jews, were to take seriously this prophetic idea that God may be working out the shalom of the world through the experiences of people who are in exile? That is, I think, what God continues to inspire the church to do. When we remember that our Lord Jesus Christ was born into the world and had nowhere to lay his head, that Christ charged the church with a mission to go to the ends of the earth, and that he told his disciples to carry with them no purse, no bag, no sandals, and instead to be completely dependent on the hospitality and mercy of others. Are we not being equipped for this work? God knows our profound need to feel at home, to have a sense of shalom in the world. And God equips us to work for the shalom of the place where we find ourselves and to make a future for the people with whom we find ourselves. There is no exile beyond God's reach because the whole world belongs to God. Amen. And God is with us wherever we live, move, and have our being. Amen. Amen. Amen.